So the Rus the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-5 puts Japan and Russia at contest with one another. Now, for the Russians, right, this land that is in northeastern China, Manchuria, is Russia's gateway to the Pacific, right? It's a way for Russia to get a toehold, to get a, a position in the Pacific and hopefully trade there. And for Japan, Manchuria is a is a sort of historically desirable place. Manchuria is very close to Japan and, and, and Japan's other ally or other territory, Korea. And this is a humiliating defeat, right? Russia has been industrializing throughout the 1800s. So Russia felt that the people of Russia felt that they should have been able to take on Japan. Japan was a newly industrializing nation. Japan had only really begun the process of modernization only about, uh, you know, what, uh, 30 years prior to this war. So Japan, you know, again, is, is, is newly industrialized, but industrializes very, very fastly uh, and very, very, uh, you know, efficiently well. And by, you know, again, 1904, 1905, Japan can 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 counter this giant uh, empire in the form of uh, Russia. Now, the Russian people in after this humiliating defeat in 1905 targets the leadership of the empire. Now, Russia is in the form of, uh, is run by a czar, that is C-Z-A-R or T-S-A-R. And in this, <clears throat> it's an absolute monarchy. And one of the things that this allows, one of the things that this absolute monarchy allows is the leadership by a certain number of oligarchic families, right? Families that have had historic power and will continue to have power in this period. So these oligarchies are, you know, the ones who sort of pull all the strings and call all the shots. There's no such thing as democracy in Russia at the time. There's no such thing as, um, you know, freedom of assembly, freedom of press, freedom of any of, of really any sort. So the people of Russia are humiliated by this defeat. They're upset by the conditions under which they are living and they start to have demonstrations. Um there's an event called Bloody Sunday on which pro during which protesters meeting about these sort of limited rights and limited opportunities that the people of Russia have are massacred in the streets by the czar's guards. This is one of the ways in which Tsar Nicholas II, the king, the, 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 the czar, the emperor of Russia at the time, begins to lose more and more credibility and more and more power. Ultimately, as a result of this, Tsar Nicholas is forced to offer some major concessions and the first major concession that he offers is the the installation of and the creation of something called the duma the duma is a deliberative assembly that allows for um some small scale democracy in no way is this sort of a you know you know, vast majority of people getting the right to vote. It's not really even sort of a parliament system system per se, but it allows for people to have the opportunity to express their concerns for the government. And again, it's it's, it's at least at least it's some attempt at this new reform. So for for a little bit of time. For a little bit of time, the Russian government, the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II, is given a bit of a break. He doesn't have to abdicate. He is sort of given a little bit of leeway in his rights. 
And then World War I breaks out. When World War I breaks out uh, in 1914, Tsar Nicholas, right, be, you know, for the, Ru I should say, for the Russians, World War I is a, um, it is a war of national pride, right? Because if you, if we as Russia can defend ourselves against Germany and the German imperial aggression, if we can fight Austria, Hungary, and their desires to take more land, we can defend the Russian fatherland. Well, that's all well and good, but once again, but once again, Russia is not competitive in this fight. So Russia cannot compete with, with Germany, with, with, with Austria, Hungary, and even, Ger even Russia's allies in war, even Russia's allies in world war one, Britain, France, uh, Britain and France, and then ultimately Italy later on, you know, Russia is the sort of junior member of this leadership. And, you know, where Britain and France and, you know, Germany and Austria-Hungary have major technological advantages, right? They have good guns, they have tanks, they have all of these strong military tools. Russia doesn't. And as I kind of say here, right, Russia doesn't have the resources to fight the war that is going on in World War I, similar to what we discussed last week, right? If we if we go back to last week and we think about what we were what I was discussing in terms of the technological changes of World War I, Russia didn't have any of that. Russia didn't have machine guns, Russia didn't have airplanes, Russia didn't have, you know, aerosol gases or anything like that. Does anybody know what the one resource Russia had was to fight this war? Anyone? What's the one thing that Russia has to throw at this war and defend itself? Manpower. Very good. Manpower is the one thing. The only thing that Russia really has to compete with is just the number of people it can, th the number of soldiers that it can throw at the war. So by the time, you know, 1915, 1916, and certainly by 19, early 1917, one of the things that Russia has been able to do is just throw soldiers at World War One. And going back to what I said a few moments ago about this oligarchic leadership, one of the things that Russia has here is that if you are a member of the oligarchy or if you are a member of the ruling families, you don't have to fight and your children, your sons don't have to fight. Instead, you can sort of pay your way out. So for the people of Russia, this is truly, you know, this is a saying that you may have heard in terms of the Civil War or in ter um, the American Civil War or other wars, right? This was a, a rich man's fight and a poor man's war, right? The idea being that, you know, the poor folks are the ones who are fighting while the rich folks are the ones who maybe have caused the war. To make matters worse, at least for Tsar Nicholas, Tsar Nicholas is the commander in chief the commander in chief of the armed forces because of this because of this czar nicholas um is leading the troops at the front line and every time that russia sees a defeat every time soldiers die families point their fingers at the czar and they they blame it on him so for czar nicholas this is a daily um this is, you know, almost something that is daily hurting his credibility. And in February of 1917, in February of 1917, in a protest of the war and a protest of what, um, 
uh, you know, what the again, what the people of, of Russia see as major failings by the government, there are spontaneous strikes that occur across the country. And the purpose of these strikes is to sort of show the czar that, that the people of Russia were not going to let this fight continue without some sort of response from the czar, right? That there need to be some sort of concessions made. Uh, so they happen all over Russia, but um, in particular, one of the big places it happens is in the C city of St. Petersburg. This grinds Russia's war efforts to a halt. You can't continue to fight a war when your military goods are being delayed, when people refuse to work. So by March the 2nd, I'm uh, sorry, by March 12th, 1917, by March 12th, 1917, Tsar Nicholas II has abdicated the throne. Tsar Nicholas has stepped down as the emperor, as the czar of Russia. 300 plus years of czarist control. 300 plus years of the Russian Empire collapses in a number of days. This happens with crazy expediency that there is the, the, the abdication of and the ending of this czarist control. Within days of this, right, Tsar Nicholas is going to be arrested and sort of put under house arrest. More on that in a little bit. And on on and by early March, by mid March, Russia has what was called a provisional government, and sort of figuring out what comes next for Russia begins, you know, begins to you know begins as the conversation, right? What comes next? Now, as I as I indicated a few moments ago, this was a desire that you know again people sort of were criticizing the czar, people were criticizing the leadership of the government. So one such person that is important to is important to remember here is a guy named, named Vladimir Lenin. So many of you may have heard of Vladimir Lenin before, uh, but Vladimir Lenin is the leader of a party called the Bolshevik Party. The Bolshevik Party uh, is this group of radicals who are really calling not just for the the end of the not just for the end of the Czar and his leadership but really an overthrow of the entire system, right? Getting rid of not just the czar, but the oligarchs and getting rid of the, the, the sort of leadership by, getting rid of the leadership by these, um, you know, these powerful families. Vladimir Lenin had been in exile for, uh, a number of years, he had been primarily in Switzerland in exile. But while in exile, he had been writing pamphlets and he had been writing uh, sort of inflammatory statements. And when the revolution starts in March and February of 1917, he comes back to Russia. And this is kind of the cool part that uh, I think is fascinating here. Vladimir Lenin was in exile in Switzerland. Switzerland, for those of you who don't know, uh, is notoriously pacifist, no notoriously peaceful, um, staying out of problems. But it's also obviously very, maybe you don't know this, it's very close to Germany. So Germany, who is fighting against Russia in World War I, buys Vladimir Lenin a one-way ticket back to Russia. So Vladimir Lenin is getting the help of Germany. Does anybody want to guess why Vladimir Lenin, or, or excuse me, why Germany would want to support Vladimir Lenin? 
what would Germany want Lenin to do? Anyone? Well, the Germans hoped that Lenin could return to Russia and not only help mobilize more of this um, revolutionary fever, but really sort of topple the government and take Russia out of World War I. So Germany is supporting Lenin with the hope that they will that Lenin will remove Russia from World War One. So Lenin is in power. Sorry, Lenin comes back to to Russia in April of seven, 1917. By this point, the first revolution has occurred. It's important for me to to at this point note something. Number what I want to point out here is that in 1917. There are two revolutions in Russia. The first one is the one that we were just talking about, which is February, March. This is when the czar abdicates. The second one happens in October, November. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So we are still here. And Lenin has just returned from Germ uh, from Switzerland, excuse me. And he is, uh, you know, the you know he is go trying to push for and antagonize uh, the leadership of Russia. As I said a few moments ago, as a result of the first revolution here, a new government is formed. This provisional government that was founded in March of 1917 makes some quick reforms. So we have three different groups that have, or really two, I guess, well, three groups that have emerged here. The first is the liberal bourgeoisie and the moderate socialists. That's really the first two. They're, they're sort of aligned together. Um in the body, in the embodiment of this guy, um, Alexander Kerensky. Kerensky is a, uh, you know, he's, he's a moderate. He doesn't want to topple the whole government. Yeah. The King needs to abdicate. And yes, um, we need to get the, 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 the factories and get the business of the of the empire out of the hands of this small group of oligarchs but he's not looking to like you know redistribute wealth and do anything like that he wants and this is what i'm sort of saying in that first point there he wants some of those and if you remember back to other conversations this semester these liberal reforms. And again, when I say liberal, I don't mean like Bernie bro or whatever. I mean, small L classical liberal, right? Ideas of equality before the law that you don't have, you know, just, you know, one set of laws for the rich and one set of laws for the poor. Uh, you know, you, uh, another desire is freedom of religion, speech and assembly, right? Those sort of first, uh, in the United States, at least, those First Amendment rights. The other piece is they want workers to have more rights. Uh, give the workers the right to a to a union. Give the right the the workers the the right to um, push for more of their own liberties. And Kerensky, in a lot of ways, is popular because. He is supportive of that. On the more extreme side is Vladimir Lenin, pictured here, and Leon Trotsky, pictured here. Leon Trotsky and Vladimir Lenin lead the more radical group called the Petrograd Soviet. 
The Petrograd Soviet is made up of urban workers. It's made up of soldiers who are upset that they had to fight World War I and you know, couldn't buy their way out of fighting. But it's also made up of this really interesting sort of radical intellectual group, this group of people who, you know, have read their Karl Marx and have read their Friedrich Engels and have talked about Robert Owen, those names that we've talked about in connection to socialism over the course of the semester. And they're going to be the ones advocating for, again, this sort of toppling down of the whole system. So, you know, again, we're only really in the spring of 1917. The revolution, the first revolution has seen the abdication of the king. The, the first revolution has seen an end to the 300 years of Romanov czarist rule. So um, it's at this point that Vladimir Lenin and so Vladimir Lenin and his 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 major party, uh, the Bolsheviks, wind up gaining more and more power. So when you see the name Bolsheviks, I want you to think of Vladimir Lenin and his. Uh, and his followers. The provisional government, and particularly the leadership of the Bolsheviks, wanted to get Russia out of World War I. World War I, right, as I said a few moments ago, has been devastating to Russia. Russia has fought since early 1914. Or, uh, yeah, well, since 1914, uh, in this war, Russia has lost millions of soldiers, millions of civilians. Everybody in Russia knows people who have died, who have perished from World War I. So, one of the major desires is to get Russia out of the war. And the Bolsheviks have this as one of their major goals. Um, now here's the issue. There's no clear person, there's no clear knowledge of who's going to win World War I at the time, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the spring of 1917, but Russia needs to leave the war to deal with this revolution. So Russia is going to ask for, and we'll talk about this, we'll talk about the treaty in a few moments. Russia is going to need to ask to leave World War I, but it's going to do so as a loser. Russia, even though Russia fought on what would become the winning side for two and a half years, Russia is officially a loser in World War I. And the Bolsheviks, uh, you know, again, have, have sort of, as I say here, have the leadership of the military by, by, by summer, late spring, early summer. 1917. So this first revolution sees the Bolsheviks gaining more support and more importantly, the abdication of the czar. Things quiet down uh, by late spring, early summer, 1917. And by late spring, early summer, the, that provisional government that had taken over after the czar had abdicated starts to run the government. So through the summer 1917, the sides of the, the, the political parties that are going to be our major protagonists here start to emerge. And that group of radical you know, liberal bourgeoisie and radicals start to coalesce into three major packets right three major groups the first group um the most moderate of them are the socialist revolutionaries the socialist revolutionaries believe that they can work with czar nicholas ii so Tsar Nicholas II had been put into uh, house arrest, essentially, and he was 
um, certainly out of power. But the belief, at least by these socialist revolutionaries, was that if we bring back Tsar Nicholas II, maybe we can work with him. Maybe we can get into a room with him and we can say, you know, these are our demands. You're going to become a constitutional monarch. You're not going to have absolute power. And a lot of you know for a lot of the people in the soviet or i should say in the russian empire at the time this was appealing let's not throw away the whole system but let's work within it and again this is not uncommon to other revolutions we've discussed so that's sort of the most moderate least radical group within the revolution the second group is a group called the Mensheviks. The Mensheviks are, they are Marxist. They are revolutionary. They want to get rid of much of the system. They do not, they do not want to work with the, the czar. They do not want to work with the current, they don't, they, they want to get rid of it. They want to create a republic. They want to get rid of the old leadership. And finally, as I've said already, under Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky, you have the most radical group, the Bolsheviks. Their desire is to collectivize all industry, get rid of the monarchy, get rid of get rid of the czar, get rid of pretty much everything, and start civilization, you know, start Russian civilization from the from you know the ground. Um so these three political parties, again, by the summer of 1917, have emerged and they are um, they're fighting one another for control within the the provisional government. By summer 1917, it's you know this is not just i mean this is not just like this is not like the united states and you know our current political discourse where groups are fighting and you can sort of say like oh there's you know, this group is crazy but you know at least they sort of sit in the same room and no one's beating each other up within this system there is not that case right there is uh there's huge fights that will start to happen between the different factions here. And in July of 1917, in a creatively titled, a creatively called period called the July Days, riots break out all over Petergrad, St. Petersburg, uh, and the government is called in to put this down. The provisional government calls in troops to put this down. And once again, the people of Russia are fired upon by their government. So their government is shooting at its citizens trying to put down these protests. Vladimir Lenin, who was, um, you know, who had to worry about his own life, flees to Finland uh, across the border from northwestern Russia. So once again, we are in a period where there is Oh, sorry, uh, where there is warfare, uh, where there's fighting in the streets, and Lenin is back into exile. So the Bolsheviks, at least for the time, have lost their leader, and they are, do they have to be fearful for their lives? So finally, after this, right, so the first revolution of 1917 happens in uh, February, March. The second revolution of 1917 happens in October, November. So the November revolution is um, where the Bolsheviks take over power. Okay, so... 
Vladimir Lenin was in exile through the end of the summer into the early fall of 1917. It is at this point that Vladimir Lenin starts to organize and become an aim for sort of what are we going to do when the Bolsheviks finally take over power. So in November of 1917, with the assistance of a group called the Red Guard, basically a vigilante group of mostly young men who go around with different types of weapons to fight the leadership of, uh, of you know, of, you know the, the Bolsheviks' enemies, he, t- he seizes more and more power. And what you need to know about this revolution of, of October, November 1917 is that this is the revolution where the, the Bolsheviks, the communists, the, the, the sort of group that the United States will have huge fights with in the Cold War comes to power. They establish what is called the Council of the People's Commissars, uh, basically This is, you know, how are we going to redistribute land? How are we going to fulfill all of those socialist promises that we had made? You know, so this, the Council of the People's Commissars, the the leadership of this new Bolshevik socialist government within the Soviet Union collects land and begins to redistribute it. It is the government that will sign the treaty. So in 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 you know as i said a few moments ago the soviet union will be forced to get out of world war 1 because it can no longer fight it because of the revolution so they will sign a treaty called the treaty of brest-litvik which is the treaty that ultimately gets russia out of the war but again it makes russia a loser so another damaging blow to the people of russia russia is forced to give up one third of all of its population uh, not one third of its land, but one third of its people, whether that's the Polish people or the Lithuanians or the Finnish people or whoever. This was a giant blow to the people of Russia. So in order to, um, so once the government has changed, right, once now that we have this, um, once we have this this new government taking over right the the council of the people's commissars now we need to to sort of implement many of these socialist changes so i just shared with you uh the documents and here is how they do that so let's take two to three minutes now uh, if you could please and read this doc read just as much as you can again in two to three minutes and we'll come back and discuss um what this is so this is on the third page this is called the law for fundamental land socialization i'll leave this up here uh and we'll come back in two minutes to discuss
Okay. So one of the big, um, uh, so in this, this document, right, one of the things that you see here is, well, you know, if you look at the first portion here, right, you see that they are making private property illegal. Um, so that, you know, again, you can't have this sort of oligarchic leadership and with their taking the land from their, from these individuals without compensation, right? This land is now going to be turned over to the, um, you know, to the government. The part that I always find really interesting whenever I reread this is this portion, right? What is this land going to be used for? It's going to be used for, you know, food production, agricultural purposes, but also for edu educational and cultural, right? We're going to establish governments. We're going to, uh, I'm sorry, schools. We're going to establish all of these different institutions to sort of help, you know, help people, again, through getting education and having access to these cultural venues like museums and other things. Um, so I think it's really, really an interesting document uh, in that respect. So once this happens, right, now the Soviet Union is officially created. And by the end of 1917, we now have a new country on the map. So the, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Republics, the USSR, the Soviet Union. And we start to see antagonism between the different groups, right? Between the democracies and others. Now, it's important for us to be aware here that the, the losers of that revolution, right? The Mensheviks, um, uh, the Mensheviks and, you know, the, 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 um, the socialist radicals, right? The, sorry, the socialist revolutionaries and, and people who support, supported the czar are not going to go down without a fight. So starting almost immediately in 1918, a civil war breaks out. And the civil war sees the fight between the white army and the red army. The white army were the anti-Bolsheviks. The, the white army was the army that opposed, um, opposed the socialist takeover. The red army were your socialists. Now, Britain, France, and Britain, France, the United States support the white army. They send in money, uh, they send in guns to support them. You don't necessarily need to know the specifics here, but ultimately, over the next year and a half or so, between 1918 and 1920, uh, this civil war ultimately results in the socialists winning, the Bolsheviks winning, and the government becoming completely socialist again by, by 1920. This, again, this is the period where, you know, we start to see truly giant concerns over the spread of communism and socialism, and ultimately the, 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 the result of, uh, you know, what, what will bring about the Cold War, you know, um, 20 years later. So we haven't mentioned yet one of the most powerful members of this leadership team here, and that is Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin, uh, born in southern Russia, uh, in the in the country of Georgia, in the country of Georgia, or the area of Georgia, ultimately moves up into Russia and helps to support the sort of growing nationalist uh, socialist fervor. When he becomes lead, so we all, I'm sure most of you know that. Um, I'm sure most of you know that Joseph Stalin becomes the leader of the Soviet Union eventually. One of the things that he does is he starts what was called the new economic policy. This new economic policy was an, a way for Russia to become industrialized. Uh, it incorporates some aspects of private ownership, 
But really the most important piece here is for the government to start to, you know, develop quotas and dictate how much, uh, how many goods should be produced on an annual basis. It's a way for the Soviet Union to really ramp up production in the 1920s. Uh, by 1928, Vladimir, um, Joseph Stalin, Vladimir Lenin's dead, and Joseph Stalin implements what were called the five-year plans. These five-year plans, as their name suggests, involve five years of organized steel production and industrial goods being produced for the country. Now, I should point out here, I think many of us have this idea that the so Soviet Union was not a good industrial powerhouse. And that's just not the case. Initially, whether it's the new economic policy or the five-year plans, they were very, very successful. And the socialist government was able to take, take Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, a country that was not industrialized really at all, uh, and turn it into a huge industrial power by the 1930s. Um, and again, Joseph Stalin, Joseph Stalin and other members of the leadership were able to do that. Okay. So the Russian revolutions of 1917 are profoundly important. Starting with its first revolution in 1905, Russia, the country that began industrializing with the um with the allies and others in 19 in the 19th century in the 1800s really could not compete uh and that the embarrassing loss to the japanese in the russo-japanese war helps to inspire a revolution in 1905 1904-1905 and that revolution ultimately sees incremental democracy being brought into incremental de, um, democracy being brought into Russia in the form of the Duma. However, uh, this Duma was not terribly successful or not terribly representative. So by 1917, in the middle of World War I, there's yet again another hiccup to occur. It's important for you to remember that there are two revolutions in 1917. The first revolution, which occurs in the winter, February and March, sees the abdication of sees the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II and the ultimate beginning the beginning of re the removal of um Russia from World War One. Through the summer of 1917, there are continuous continuing struggles between the different leaderships, the 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 Mensheviks, the um the socialist revolutionaries, and the Bolsheviks. And ultimately in the fall of 1917, by November of 1917, the Soviet Union uh, sorry, uh, the Bolsheviks have taken control over the government. Again, this is a hugely significant event and a hugely significant um, period because it will set up this world division between capitalist and communist. And ultimately, will help us lead to the 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 Cold War that will that will drive the world from nineteen ninety uh, some from nineteen forty five until nineteen ninety one. When we see each other after when we see each other after spring break, uh, so uh, after when we see each other after spring break, we will talk about the nineteen twenties and thirties. We'll talk about the rise of fascism with people like Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini in Germany and Italy, respectively.
We will look at the we will look at World War II, and then we will ultimately look at the Cold War thereafter. So that's my way of saying. Uh, so next week we do not meet on Thursday. On Thursday, April 25th, we do not meet because it is spring break. We will meet again um, on May the 9th. The 9th, yeah, May 9th. No, that seems too far. Um, no, it is a Thursday. It's a Thursday. May it 9th. Is? Yeah. Yeah, but I think we meet before then, May 2nd. No, I think that's when the. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it is May 2nd. Yeah. Anyway, we don't meet next week, the 25th, but we do May, May we meet May 2nd. Uh, so you have an assignment due in a number of hours. Please make sure that you are you have submitted it by 1159. Um, I you know only about two of you have submitted it so far. So please make sure that you submit it by by them. Um yeah, you got so class um uh, classes do resume on 